This is going to be a retro video. I'm going to try and get an old EEPROM programmer from the mid 90s up and running using an early Windows 95 laptop so I can burn video games for a vintage ballet console. This will be a fast paced video but there will be a full write up with photos and code on my website. One of my hobbies is old arcade machines and vintage video game consoles. One challenge is that many of the components are four decades old and long out of production. Being able to read and write chips from the 70s is quite handy. I'm currently restoring a 1978 ballet console. According to this ad from the October 1977 issue of Popular Electronics, it's a teaching device, an arcade game, musical instrument, and a home computer. The new Bally Library computer provides more entertainment and services than man has ever dreamed possible from a single consumer product. Later in 82, it was renamed to the Bally Astrocade. Despite having better graphics, sound, and expansion than the Atari, it just wasn't marketed very well, and it disappeared a few years after the 1983 video game crash. To work on the Bally, I'll need to be able to replace 8-bit 24-pin 8K ROM chips. I'm not aware of any modern PIN-compatible substitutes, but surplus EEPROMs are available. It is possible to adapt newer 28-pin chips, but there are space considerations, and keeping the pin out the same is much easier. Previously, I demonstrated how to program EEPROM chips using a Raspberry Pi, but that method used a serial protocol, which only requires four data lines, MOSI, MISO, chip select, and clock. For the console and its game carts, I'll be using vintage parallel EEPROM chips. These are the ones with the quartz window on the top. They require a parallel programmer. I have a TL8662, which is a good inexpensive USB programmer that can do both parallel and serial. However, these older EEPROM chips are not currently supported and probably won't ever be because they require 25 volts for programming. I looked at other modern programmers that fit my requirements, but they're very expensive. I have an old Needhams Electronics PB10 programmer which would work, however, it requires an old-school 8-bit ISA slot, which was phased out of consumer PC motherboards around the turn of the century. I asked around if anyone had an old 286 or 386 in their garage, but struck out. I also looked on Craigslist and eBay and was surprised at the high prices. Apparently, there are a lot of people building retro gaming computers, which does sound like a fun project. Instead, I found a parallel version of my Needhams programmer on eBay for $40 US. Back in 96, it sold for $449, and it's an upgrade over my ISA version. It was recommended by several users on the arcade forums. The EMP20 has a parallel interface, which is also obsolete technology, but not as rare as ISA. I had no trouble finding a free compatible laptop with a parallel port. Here's a Micron Transport laptop, also circa 1996. I was at a client's office and noticed it was being used as a monitor stand. It has a 3.5 inch floppy disk drive, the front has an IR port and an 8-speed CD-ROM, CD only, no DVDs or burning. There are two PCMCIA slots. One has a 33.6 baud modem fax. The other has a Zircom 10-100 Ethernet card, no Wi-Fi. Behind a sliding panel on the back, a VGA port, and the parallel port required for the EEPROM programmer. Another slide conceals what appears to be a docking station connector. A third slide hides a DB9 serial port. There's also a rear-facing IR port headset, microphone and line jacks, PS2 mouse and keyboard, S-video, and composite video. Back in October of 96, these Micron laptops were expensive, with a base price of $4,399 US. My model has the base 133 MHz CPU and has the optional 32 MB EDO RAM module, which was a $749 extra. It also has the bigger 2.1 GB EID hard drive. Adjusted for inflation, this laptop would have been around $9,000 out the door. It has a 12.1 inch Active Matrix color display, which at the time was good for gaming, although 800x600 resolution is a little high for DOS games. The display is driven by a PCI graphics accelerator with one megabyte of RAM. The keyboard's fantastic. The keys have a substantial feel and a very satisfying click. It has both a pointing stick and a touchpad. A custom LCD strip provides system feedback. It also has stereo speakers and a 16-bit sound card. Mine was missing the power adapter, but I never throw out power supplies. A quick look through my part bins, and I found an original replacement. Micron, 15 volt, 1.9 amps. The modem and network dongles were missing, but my parts bins also yielded the correct Zircom network dongle. I was unable to locate a modem dongle, which is too bad because I don't have a fax machine, so it would have been kind of handy. But network access is what matters most, because this laptop doesn't have any USB ports. Okay, the moment of truth. I'll press the power button. A single beep, that's a good sign. Very noisy hard drive. The memory looks okay. It still has the original operating system, Windows 95. Okay, I fast forwarded. The boot time took a minute and 20 seconds. Slow but impressive that everything still works after 20 years. 
Even the clock's correct. I can't believe the CMOS battery is still good. The Windows 95 GUI is primitive, but I'm sure some people would argue it's still better than Windows 10. Let's try the web. Microsoft Internet Explorer 3.0. Google kinda works. News doesn't seem to be compatible. I doubt YouTube will work. No. How about a search for Windows 95 tools? That worked. Let's try 95 is alive. That error message might be an SSL issue. I'll switch HTTPS to HTTP and try again. There we go. This brings me back. The web has come a long way since Y2K. Although the page does load faster than some modern sites. Since everything works, the first thing I want to do is clone the hard drive because I don't have any of the original disks or drivers. Also, the hard drive is 20 years old and doesn't sound very good. I'll use Semantic Ghost to clone the drive over the network. On an old Windows XP PC, I'll run Ghostcast Server, Micron 1 for the session name, and set it to create a drive image. Browse to save the image in a desktop folder called Images, and Micron 1 for the file name. Click Accept Clients, which will wait for a clone job. I use the Ghost application to generate a Windows 95 boot disk with network support. Insert it into the floppy and restart the laptop. Once the Ghost cloning software starts, click Ghost Cast, Directed Broadcast, Micron 1 to match the session name, and OK. OK again, Fast for the compression type, and Yes to proceed with image file creation. Back on the XP machine, the Micron's hard drive image is being received. There are other ways to clone a hard drive. You could pull the hard drive and use a USB to IDE adapter on a modern computer in conjunction with cloning software, such as Clonezilla, which I think also has a network option, but I haven't tried it. Fast forward 11 and a half minutes and a successful hard drive image has been saved. The hard drive is secured by a single screw on the bottom of the case. Squeeze the latch and the removable caddy easily slides out. There's an IDE adapter mounted with two screws. Looks like it's proprietary, but I'm not sure. I'll remove the two screws and two more on the bottom, which secures the drive to the caddy. Now the adapter can be pulled off. I'm being very careful to pull straight as not to bend or break the IDE pins or the adapter. I'm going to replace the hard drive with a SEBA solid state dual CF drive adapter. A removable CF card provides 16 gigabytes of storage. This is much more than I'll need, but it was the cheapest I could find. The solid state should also improve the boot speed. The original ID adapter plugs into the new drive. Everything fits correctly in the drive caddy. I'll replace the four screws. Unfortunately, there's no room to remove the CF card once it's installed in the caddy. This would have been preferable because it would facilitate file transfers. The drive is reinserted, and now I just have to use Ghost Restore to finish the cloning. Back on the XP machine, Micron 2 for the session name, leave the radio button on Restore Image, Browse, and select the saved drive to image Micron 1. Then click Accept Clients and OK. I rebooted the Micron with the Ghost Boot Disk. Again, click Ghost Cast, Directed Broadcast, Micron 2 for the session name, and OK. OK, OK, and yes to wait for the restore. Back on the XP computer, click Send to start the restore. After 9 minutes, the clone is complete. In theory, the new drive should be good to go. Unfortunately, the laptop just froze upon reboot. Apparently, the BIOS can't support hard drives over 8GB. I got it working by switching to an SD card based adapter with an old 4GB SD card. I like this adapter better because the SD card can be removed without having to unscrew and disassemble the caddy. This will facilitate file transfers. Neither SD nor CF cards are a great solution for a Windows OS because of the large number of writes to the swap file, which will reduce the life of the cards. Still, I have a lot of SD cards and this laptop will be getting light use. Also, the programming software is DOS based, so I could just modify the MS-DOS sys file to boot to DOS and avoid Windows. Furthermore, with the Ghost software, I can spin up a new SD card clone in 10 minutes. In order to expedite file transfers to the Micron laptop, I'll install an FTP server. After a lot of Googling, I found a free FTP server for Windows 95 called War Daemon. This is version 1.71 beta. I downloaded it to another computer. It's 3.6 megabytes, which is too big for a 1.4 megabyte floppy, so I burned it to a CD-ROM. It took a minute, but the Micron CD player is able to read the writable disk. I'll copy the file from the CD to the desktop to speed up the install. I'll start the installation program. The files are being uncompressed. Click Install. I'll change the FTP server site name to Rototron. Run automatically as a service. I'll move the FTP root folder to C colon FTP, which will make it easier to locate from DOS-based programs. Lose anonymous access. Enter a system admin password. Skip the email. Port 21 is good. Fast forward and the FTP server is installed. 
There's a yellow FTP icon in the system tray. I'll click it and then enter the system admin password. OK, the FTP server is running and has a valid IP address. Here's the EMP20 device programmer. It has a 48-pin ZIF socket. The SIM socket on the left is for personality modules. There are around 30 different SIM modules that let you program different families of devices. This module is 23AB, which is for complex programmable logic devices and would probably be used in conjunction with a PLCC to dip adapter. FYI, if you're in the market for an EMP20, make sure it comes with the SIM modules you need or else it's pretty worthless. On the back is a parallel port, power jack, and an on-off switch. This unit was made in March of 1996 by Needham's Electronics based in Sacramento, California. It's held together with four screws, easy to open. I wish all cases were this simple to take apart. The layout is very clean, all through hole components, no surface mount. I don't have the power supply and there's no voltage markings. However, there's a UL recognized RS-401 bridge rectifier. This indicates the programmer expects an AC power supply as opposed to DC. The barrel jack indicates low voltage and this rectifier is rated for a maximum of 4 amps. The electrolytic caps all look in good condition. Looks like the cooling fan is 12 volts, so the programmer probably requires at least a 12 volt AC supply. There's a socketed Xilinx FPGA, several 74 series logic chips, and SP720s for ESD protection, presumably on all the ZIF pins. All the chips are socketed, which is great for troubleshooting. If the unit isn't working, one of the first things I'd try is to reseat all the chips in their sockets. My TL8662 USB programmer also can be used to test 74 series logic chips. A parallel cable is used to connect the programmer to the laptop. The Centronics connector is plugged into the programmer and clipped down. The DB25 connector is screwed into the laptop's parallel port. I'm using a 3 foot cable. Generally speaking, shorter is more reliable. Since I'll mainly be working with 8 bit EEPROM chips, I'll swap out the 23AB SIM for the 1AB SIM. This will probably be the most common SIM that I use. A surplus Motorola 8K EEPROM is plugged into the ZIF socket and locked down. I'm careful to align the side with the notch with the markings on the programmer. These chips can be easily destroyed if the voltage is reversed. You'll know if it's wrong because the quartz window will light up. The EMP20 programming software requires MS-DOS. Click Start, Programs, MS-DOS Prompt. You can also reboot the computer and press F8 for safe mode with command prompt only, which would be more reliable for DOS applications. I already copied the EMP20 software to a folder named EMP. CD C colon EMP. DIR lists the directory contents. EMP20 starts the app. Version 4.17, which dates from 1989 to 1999, is the most recent I could find on the web. Attempting to establish communication with the programmer. OK, it's working so far. One of the reasons I went with an FTP server on the laptop is because I'll be writing software in VS Code, which requires a modern OS but supports tasks to save via FTP. Here's Microsoft VS Code running on a Raspberry Pi 3. The open file treasure.asm is Z80 assembly code for the Bally console game Treasure Cove. It was generously released into the public domain by Spectre Systems in 2001. I created a build task that will assemble the code using the ZMac assembler and then open the binary in MAME. You could just play the game using an emulator, but in my opinion, it's a much better experience on the original hardware. Click Terminal Run Task. I created another task called Assemble an FTP. Instead of opening the binary in MAME, it's transmitted by FTP to the code folder on the Micron. The binary can now be written to an EEPROM so it can be played on the Bally console. I'll post all the code for the tasks on my website. On the laptop, typing DIR in the FTP code folder shows the uploaded Treasure Cove binary. CD back to the EMP20 application folder and run the program. Press 5 to select a device. Scroll down to Motorola, select 68766. The program are initialized. The buffer device and file ranges are all hex 0 to 1FFF, which is correct for an 8K chip. Press V to select the file name, F1 to browse, up a directory, and switch to the FTP folder, and then the code folder. Select Treasure Bin. 8 loads the binary file from the disk into the buffer. Successful. 7 opens the buffer editor. You can review and make edits here to the code. 2 verifies the EEPROM is erased. Error. Which isn't unexpected since I bought these EEPROMs from a surplus store and they're obviously used. Unlike E EEPROMs, which can be erased electronically, 
Regular EEPROMs require 253.7 nanometer UV light to erase. You could set the chip out in the sun for a few days, but a faster way is to use a UV eraser. Along with the EMP20, I also picked up a vintage Spectronics PE140T UV eraser circa 1988. The T model comes with a timer. Here's the PE140T. A tray on the bottom pulls out, which can hold up to 9 EEPROM chips. I'll close the drawer and set the timer for about 30 minutes. Press and hold the on button until the light stays on. While I'm waiting for the chips to erase, I'll go ahead and replace the fan in the EMP20, which is really loud. The laptop is now whisper quiet since replacing the hard drive, so let's see if the EMP20 noise levels can be improved too. It's kind of hard to tell from the microphone on my camera, but the fan is making a very loud, high-pitched whine. Before replacement, I'll measure the airflow with a nanometer. This isn't very accurate, but it should give me a good relative value for wind speed. It's about 3 meters per second. I'll replace the fan with a 5000 RPM Noctua, which is supposed to be a very quiet unit. I installed the new fan. Not sure if you can tell from the recording, but it's now much quieter. Unfortunately, it looks like the airflow has been reduced to around 2.5 meters per second. That's not too bad. I'll just have to monitor the EMP20 temperature to ensure it's not running too hot now. Okay, it's been about 30 minutes. The timer just shut off and the EEPROM chip should be erased. I'll re-verify the device is erased. Verify erase successful. Everything should be good to go now. Press 1 to program and enter. The device is now programming. It'll probably take around 5 minutes. While programming, I'll take a look at the current draw because I still need to find an appropriate power adapter. Currently I'm using a Variac to provide 12 volts AC to the EMP20. At rest, the programmer is drawing about 500 milliamps. When the programming is initiated, it jumps to around 1.4 amps. Therefore, a 12 volt AC adapter rated for at least 2 amps would suffice. I'll probably go with 3 amps for a little extra buffer. The device was successfully programmed. It took about 6 minutes. It might be possible to speed that up using a different algorithm or by adjusting the port settings. I'll run the verify again by selecting 3. The device successfully verified. I should have a working game ROM now. Here's the Bally Astrocade that I'm repairing. I'll probably make a video on the full restore. I designed and etched a game cartridge PCB and plugged in the Treasure Cove EEPROM. I also 3D printed a cartridge case that I downloaded from Thingiverse. The PCB goes inside and the case snaps together. I added a hole on top of the cartridge so I could socket the EEPROM and change out the games. The cart fits securely in the Astrocade. In theory, pressing the reset button should load the game. It worked! I hope you found this video interesting. You can support this channel by subscribing, leaving a like, and sharing. Thanks for watching, subscribing, and all the positive feedback.